Hello everybody, it's Mike here at Gay from Scratch, and in the past on this channel, we looked at C++, C Sharp, Hacks, Lua, JavaScript, and Python developed game engines. Today, we are going to look at that new breed of game engines, the codeless or um, no-code game engines, which more specifically are visual programming languages. Now, the truth of the matter is, you are still coding here. You're just doing it in a different interface, some kind of a visual, either behavior, event, spreadsheet, or uh, node graph kind of approach to game development. But the the entire idea here is one of a couple of approaches. It's either designed for uh, where programmers can easily expose attributes to designers, or it's designed to be easier to use and more of an introductory approach to game engines. And what we're going to do is look at first 3D game engines and then 2D game engines that have visual scripting interfaces. Now, as you can see, I have an article up on Game From Scratch. It has everything we're about to cover here, quite literally. So. If you missed something in the video, don't worry. Check out the link down below. And in that link as well, I have links to the earlier coverage we did about the different programming languages by game engines. So if you are looking for a specific game engine to use with a specific programming language, I got you covered there. So without further ado, let us jump in. Now, the first engine we are going to talk about today is the Armory 3D game engine. Now, Armory is built on top of of Blender. It's gone a bit quiet. There hasn't really been an update in a couple of months, and I'm starting to get a little worried there. Uh, but this one uses Blender's system. Uh, you've got two ways of programming it. You can program using nodes inside of Blender, like you see on the graphic in front of you, or you can use the Hacks programming language. It's not the most beginner-friendly product out there, but if you already know um, Blender, then this could be a great choice for you. On that topic, there's also Verge 3D and... Um, Oh, the one that it was based off. It's not coming to me right now, but there's a couple other ones that also run inside of Blender, but it's Armory that I'm going to focus on today. Now, next up, we have BuildBox. Now, I just discussed BuildBox the other day, and it's under the 3D category just because BuildBox 3 just shipped, and it has um, 3D support as the, along with the 2D support. Uh, so here you can see it uses a flowchart type um, approach. It's a lot less flexible than a lot of other game engines. Basically, if it doesn't have the functionality you want outside of the box, you're probably a bit screwed. But it's also one of the easiest to use. It's also got a pretty hefty price tag, which did come down a bit, but it's still quite expensive. A couple hundred dollars a year on a subscription basis. So next up, we have CryEngine. Now, CryEngine's visual programming language, I pronounce it wrong all the time. I'm going to go to schematic to this today. Uh, but basically, it is more designed so that you can expose parts of your game out to a designer. So you're still going to need a programmer to make games using CryEngine. But as you can see, uh, there is this schematic system that you can use for developing the game logic inside of CryEngine. Uh, it is more complicated than a lot of them. This is not really designed to be an alternative programming language to the other options. It's designed to be supplemental. So you can make it so that... Um, you know, like a designer can see this come in and tweak values and play with things and change them around. But it's not designed as kind of like you don't write your entire game using schematic in CryEngine. Next up, we have Coffee Cube. Coffee Cube actually takes a bit of a different approach. Uh, there is now a completely free version of it. Um, so that's definitely made it a more approachable engine. I did a full tutorial series on this guy. And by the way, for anything where I have more details, I did a tutorial series on Armory that I discussed earlier. There will be a learn more link on the Game From Scratch article. So if you want to learn more about a particular game engine, if I have covered it either in a video or a tutorial series, there will be a link there for you to learn more. So Copper Cube, uh, its approach is pretty straightforward. You basically add these behaviors and you do things like add um, behaviors to objects like fly on a circle, rotate, follow things. You add uh, actions on top of behaviors and so on. So it's, it's using a menu-based system. Now, if you hit uh, a wall with Copper Cube, you can write your own extensions using the JavaScript programming language, however, but you can do a whole lot without touching a line of code. It is a very nice beginner-friendly language in that case, or, or an engine in that case. Plus, of course, you get all the other tools like world design, uh, train creation, and so on. Next up, we have the Godot game engine. Now, Godot's primary programming mechanism is the uh, GDScript uh, scripting language, and on top of that, you have um, c sharps support um, increasingly coming soon. And then on top of that, we also have visual programming, as you can see it in front of you. Now, the truth of the matter is, uh, I don't really see any value in this as it stands. It's just, it's not 
high level enough to be really useful and it's low level enough that you might as well just use GD script. But I think this might be the beginning of something coming in the future. Uh, let me know if you've got a different opinion down below, but in my experience is visual script in Godot brings nothing to the equation. It's not good for a beginner. And if you already know how to script, it's not efficient. So I don't really know what purpose this is serving other than to check off the checkbox for we have a visual scripting language too. Although this is ground zero and things do tend to improve over time, especially with an open source project like this, if someone embraces it. Um, so this could just be the basis of something coming in the future. But as it stands right now, I see very little reason to actually recommend using uh, Visual Script in Godot. Next up, we have Unity. Unity does not belong on this list yet, but I'm including them for a couple of reasons. First off, Visual Scripting is one of their to-do features for the 2019. So in 2019, they are going to be getting their own visual programming language, at least in beta form. On top of that, they also have a number of add-ons from the add-on store. What you're seeing in front of you is from the Bolt add-on. It uses a traditional flow graph type approach to enable you to visually script any object inside of the Unity game engine. And there are other uh, add-ons. There's Playmaker and a couple of others in the asset store that are the most popular ones. So if you want to add visual scripting to the Unity game engine, it is definitely an option there. Now, we also have Unreal Engine. Now, Unreal Engine is probably the reason why a lot of these guys have their visual programming languages at the higher end is Blueprints is a full-blown programming system. You can write a game entirely in Blueprints. Now, at the same time, Blueprints are really advanced. So you're basically learning to program here. It's not like a, a complete replacement. Now, the question is, does this kind of programming speak to you? And the alternative in the world of um, Unreal Engine isn't something friendly like Lua or C Sharp or something. It's C++. So this is one of those cases where, yes, if you are an artist with no programming experience, you are going to get up to speed faster using Blueprints than you are using C++. And at the same time, they've also done a whole lot of performance improvements. And I believe when Blueprints were first launched, they ran at about one-tenth the speed of C++. Now they're actually being compiled to C++. So you're getting comparable level of performance other than, you know, your hand optimization stuff isn't there. So there isn't a huge huge performance price to be gained or paid to use blueprints in Unreal Engine, but they are also really, really advanced. There are like hundreds of nodes in it. Uh, so you do get into a layer of complication. And what you also get with any kind of um, a branching type system like this is some of these things is your if evaluations to such actually start turning into way more than it would just be as a single line of code. It could turn into six or seven nodes instead of just one line of code. So that's kind of the trade off you're playing, you're, you're getting when you're using these node based systems. Okay, so now we're moving into 2D world. And the first one we're gonna talk about in the 2D world is Click Team Fusion 2.5. Now I actually did a review of Click Team Fusion. It's, clicked in the, it's what you will get if you click the learn more link. And this guy is probably most famous for being behind the Five Nights at Freddy series. Um, it uses a graph-based system of a bunch of properties. You, you click into different categories on different events in these kind of a spreadsheet type flow chart. Watch the learn more to learn more. Uh, it, it's a bit tricky to document here. At first it's actually quite daunting. It actually looks scarier than learning a scripting language, but it quickly starts to make sense. And you're going to notice this approach is actually pretty common, not really with this uh, two, 2D grid approach they've got here. Uh, so you got to learn what each one of these icons means. So that's like your events, for example. So if you want to handle an event of uh, event type or like input, in uh, start of frame, you would click that checkbox and then you do the details within that one. Here are your system level events uh, and so on. So that's the Click Team Fusion approach. Next up, we have Construct 3. This one is a commercial, oh, so is Click Team, by the way. It's a pay once license, I believe. Uh, Click Team, or Construct 3 is a subscription based license, around $100 a year, I believe. Um, you can try it completely free. I've done a hands on with this guy. If you want to check that out, click the Learn More link. Uh, this one is built in runs in your browser, you're actually generating an HTML5 game behind the scenes. And one of the nice things is they just released a new version that enables you to do inline JavaScript code directly inside of Construct3 without requiring an add-on or a plugin. Uh, Construct3's approach goes with this method. There is their programming model. So you see here, it's kind of events and then, or um, 
behaviors and events that you kind of respond to, and then you have actions and objects and such that are handled. Uh, again, it's a fairly common way of working with things with the event sheets in this particular case. Next up, we have Stencil. Now, Stencil is another one I've covered. Click learn more to learn more. Uh, Stencil is all about not requiring coding either. Once again, you can see it uses behaviors and events. In this particular case, it is using this Lego style approach. You're gonna see this again in just a second where I believe Stencil got this um, idea behind, but you see it's kind of building blocks that slot into other building blocks. It's like Lego pieces that can only slot into Lego pieces of their particular kind. Um, it, it is pretty straightforward to be honest. Now one of the cool things with Stencil is it's actually a code generator. It's generating hacks code uh, behind the scenes and you can also use the hacks programming language 100% with Stencil. So you don't need to use this behavioral approach or the, this um, visual approach to do your coding, uh, but it is certainly an option. Now next up we have Scratch and uh, you're gonna see something that looks very similar to Stencil, but this is aimed at kids. And this is MIT Labs um, that created and maintained Scratch, and this was is designed to teach people an introduction to programming. And it's very kiddish, it's very basic, and as you can see, it uses that same Lego block approach. Um, but again, this one is a lot more, it comes with a bunch of graphics. It's a very, very, very child, friendly setup. It's quite simple. If you're about eight or nine years old, uh, Scratch is probably about ideal, or if you're trying to teach someone of that age group. Uh, speaking of which, I also have an article. I will link it down below on uh, getting your kids started in game development. It goes through a bunch of the languages we're actually talking about here, and a couple of the scripting-based ones. So next up, we have GDevelop. Now, GDevelop has a lot in common with Construct, and a little bit in common with like, Team Fusion, but Construct and GDevelop are very, very, very similar, with one major exception. GDevelop is open source and free which is a pretty major development. And once again, it is an action in behavior sheet approach. So you see here, you kind of got a, a list of events and then um, actions that happen or conditions that make those actions happen. Um, and that's kind of the uh, the way you go about programming and you develop. Now, next thing again is you can also do straight out, um, I believe it's JavaScript only now. It used to be C++ as well, but I think it's just JavaScript now. Uh, coding for your specific game objects makes it quite easy. If you kind of run into a limitation of what GDevelop's got available to you, you can quite easily extend upon that. Next up, we have the seminal Game Maker Studio. Now, Game Maker Studio has been around for a long time, and most people use their Game Maker script for doing their programming, but that is not the only option. They have another option in there called Drag and Drop. And you can see it uses this step-by-step uh, -step based of blocks or things, things like, uh, like just building blocks that you kind of build together. I have an in-depth guide to uh, um, Game Maker Studio 2 that will show you how this actually works. Um, I don't know that I like the icon-based approach because a lot of these make absolutely no sense to me. Like, what's the difference between a Pac-Man, a Pac-Man with uh, some slices through it, a Pac-Man, okay, that's probably a rotating Pac-Man. Like, it's, it's not immediately obvious what a lot of these icons do. Um, like this branching versus this one, which just branches one way. And well, how is that different than an else? Or, you know, I, I kind of, the iconic approach does not really appeal to me. And I don't know, and I'm, I'm not really meaning to speak broadly of this, but I don't know that a lot of people using Game Maker Studio are actually using the drag and drop support. I also don't know if there's a performance cost to be paid, but do be aware that if you go with Game Maker Studio, there is a full blown, um, drag and drop based programming option in there. And Game Maker, once again, is a commercial uh, $99 licensed game engine with a bunch of other platforms that have an additional cost attached. Next up, we have Game Salad. Now I'm gonna be straight up honest. I have almost zero experience with Game Salad at all. From their own description, they kind of target it towards the educational market with Game Salad. Um, you can see here they use uh, an kind of a very similar approach to that we've seen in the past with, you know, we've got a conditional going on, otherwise do this, do this, do this, kind of tap screen to do this, kind of event approach where you kind of, you know, uh, event and then reaction kind of uh, approach to things. Now, if you run into limitations, is Game Salad good there? I don't know. There's a whole lot of things literally about Game Salad I just do not know. But it is a 2D game engine that is um, aimed again at that educational market and I don't have a lot of experience with it. So I'm mostly just mentioning it. And then finally, we have Pixel Game Maker MV. 
And uh, this one's from the same guys that make RPG Game Maker. And I should mention that there's a bunch of other game engines out there that are very specific to one particular genre that I'm not covering here. So you've also got things like uh, Adventure. There's a no game novel maker. There's RPG Game Maker. Uh, there's Game Boy Studio, which I covered just uh, a couple of weeks ago. There's um, Adventure Game Studio. There's um, one that's built on LibGDX. It's all about making adventure games that are all using a visual programming interface, but they are specific to one particular genre or type of game so I didn't cover them in this list but I did cover Pixel Game Maker MV because this is all about creating 2D you know platformer shoot 'em up kind of games with a bunch of different genres and it's from the same publisher as RPG Maker MV now uh, it uses this kind of flow chart based approach and a bunch of conditionals and it's crap um yeah, I guess we can leave it there. <laughs> I don't normally throw my opinion so strongly at a game engine, but for something that costs $100, comes with this programming interface that is just confusing as hell. I, I, I literally have talked about um, dozens upon dozens of game engines on this channel, and I don't really see any upsides to, to Pixel Game Maker MV. Like, there is very rarely that there is a game engine out there that I don't see a single thing to recommend for it especially when it's 100 bucks on Steam or often on sale for like 70 or whatever. But still, I, I don't, it's in its current state, it's not worth picking up. And I've been keeping an eye on it since I bought it in early access, which it's still in. It's been over a year and, and it's still it's still pretty terrible. I, I honestly could not give you a single reason to pick it up over, say, the Godot game engine, which is open source and free. And for every other game engine in this list, I could give you at least one reason to pick it up over Godot. So I guess that kind of speaks to something. Okay, that is it. That is the end of it. That is the codeless visual scripting game engines. And once again, I also have um, links for, say, C++ game engine. So if you want to learn C++, there is a list of the game engines out there that use C++. And I've done it for Hacks, Lua, JavaScript, Python, and C++. And as I mentioned earlier on, I also did an article about teaching kids how to program games and which game engines and technologies to look for. I will link that down below as well. Uh, I may have missed one or ten. Uh, if so, let me know in the comments down below. And if you have used any of these particular game engines and you have an opinion, I would love to hear it in the comments down below as well. And now I know a lot of people, visual programming isn't necessarily for you, and I get it. Uh, and this isn't meant to be for everybody. In almost every case, or at least say 75% of the game engines we're seeing here, the, um, the target audience isn't really... Uh, you a lot of times if you're a dedicated programmer this is more for a different segment but I'd be interested in hearing your opinions in the comments down below and I will talk to you all later goodbye